Well, a warm welcome to this video, and it's always a, a fascinating and a, and a pleasure to welcome back Professor Tim Spector. Professor, thank you for coming back. It's great to be back, John. Looking forward to it. So most people uh, know Tim Spector as a professor at uh, King's College in London, is a physician, uh, epidemiologist and geneticist, author, and of course, international researcher. Now, at the very top of this description, there's going to be a link to what's called the Big Poo Study. Tim, please tell us what the Big Poo Study is and why it's important. Well, it's, uh, it's the largest investigation ever into the bowel habits of the population. And it's something that just hasn't been done before. It's been... Um, neglected really in, in the world of science and uh, we're trying to do is is doing this in partnership with the UK's Channel 4 TV program and Steph's Pack Lunch. Uh, we want to get the, the largest by far nationwide survey on gut health and bowel habits and we currently have over a hundred thousand participants already and we want to at least double that with all the people listening today. And the goal is to understand the health and guts and bowel habits of the UK and engage people really into this, this really important topic of gut health. Uh, explore, you know, how ages and ethnic origins and demographics, diet, lifestyle, your medications you're taking, how they affect your gut health and your bowel habits. And this, you know, we hope that all this knowledge is going to really help the millions of people who do suffer from digestive problems that don't really get the attention uh, in science and medicine uh, that, that we should be doing. Um, and from a sort of scientific perspective, uh, this study is going to greatly exceed any prior work because um, by having you know, hundreds of thousands of people, we can get lots of diverse backgrounds, different ethnicities, ages, and we have to realize that we know very little about uh, bowel frequency and stool consistency. And the only studies really ever done were uh, in the 1980s in the UK by colleagues from Bristol, um, who only studied about 1,800 individuals. And they used the Bristol stool study, Bristol stool form uh, scale, which a lot of people know about, it's quite famous. But there were a lot of limitations to that study. There were the small sample size. It was exclusively white population in the Bristol area. Um, it was mainly males restricted to 40 and 69. And uh, there were only four questions in it. So it, it's crazy that the whole world depends on this one tiny survey to work out what is normal and what's abnormal. And that's really what... Uh, that's why we want to get something better, why we really want to improve this whole field. Mm. I've actually completed this survey uh, myself uh, this morning. You just click on the link. It's remarkably easy and it asks you some questions. And th this actually reflects your new approach to studying epidemiology, really, Tim, doesn't it? I mean, how, how has your work changed over the past few years with the advent of the, uh, the, the technological approach that you now have to epidemiology? Well, John, as you know, from our chats about COVID, it's changed dramatically. And mm. uh, when, you know, the company I co-founded, Zoe, uh, got involved with COVID and launched the, the Zoe COVID study uh, in 2020, none of us realised how much it would change uh, research. And the fact we had four million people download that app within a few weeks mm. and we were able to engage with millions of people and get data in real time within a, you know, a few days or weeks and give that data back to them has really you know, trans, totally transformed my view of what epidemiology should be and also you know, how I think everyone's going to do research in the future. And it's also, for, you know, we're never going to go back to the pencil and paper that we used to depend on and used to take years to get replies from people and chase them up and now 
you just do it on an app, you fill in that form, you get it back. And then, you know, we give people instant feedback really on their results and they feel part of this, this new sort of research community. And I think it's a totally exciting time because, you know, we, it's no longer passive to be a citizen scientist. I think people feel that they really are contributing. They're seeing it directly. It's not something that happens, you know, they find out years later. And I think everyone learned this from the COVID um, pandemic, how important it was for everyone to participate, to try and understand things, to listen to podcasts, to, you know, uh, do things that would improve potentially their health and their family and make the right decisions. And I think this is very, very uh, crucial. And I think we're never going to go back again. So these large scale projects are the way forward. And you can just see that, you know, compared to what we did in the 1980s, you know, 1,800 people surveyed with four questions probably, you know, took them several years to perform and publish. You know, we can do this 100 times faster, quicker, better, you know, just with the technology. And I think this Mm -hmm. is why it's so exciting. And um, I think it allows us to explore many of these things that don't get the funding that don't get the attention that it deserves. You know, we're not talking about rare cancers. We're not talking about fatal heart attacks, but we're talking about the things that really matter to many people, you know, gut habits, bowel problems, irritable bowel syndrome, food intolerance, all this stuff that, um, you know, the Western world complains about, but no one's really studying because it's you know, it doesn't get the funds. And, and this is where citizen science really comes into its own, I think. And you know, people realise that they do this stuff. You know, as you said, it's pretty easy. It's a short anonymous survey. It takes about five minutes. You know, just we're asking simple things. How often you 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 have a poo? How many times you go? Uh, you know, are you straining? Is there any constipation? Um, you know, and even talking about flatulence and farting, sure. uh, things that mm. uh, in general the, the British public don't like talking about. But, you know, mm. this is really crucial if we understand what is normal and what isn't and this is a whole new approach to physiology that i I really uh find fascinating tim that in the past physiology has been done maybe by looking at an organ doing some detailed studies on an individual but here we're looking at physiology in the light of the whole population so we can extrapolate that which is which is the norm for 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 everyone and then when we know the norm we can compare the abnormal against it so it's absolutely vital a vital way to learn about yeah in the physiology past, that we simply didn't know exactly that the, the sort of previous studies you know were based on maybe 10 volunteers who are usually students getting credits uh who are <laughs> yeah. roped into it and yeah. you know for adults very tubes often stuck down them blood take out of them yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and um, Whereas you get people you know, like me in the so population. So they're very unrepresentative of the general population. Yeah. No. Uh, no, no yeah, I think, you, I think that's right. You and I wouldn't make, <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't yeah. be allowed in. We wouldn't be allowed in those physiology studies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'd, we're, we're too old and decrepit. So they'd say, well, you know, um, everything we've learned about a lot of human physiology and simple stuff is based on very tiny numbers of very fit people, usually males. And so that's why getting cruder results, because it's undoubtedly cruder, but in, you know, thousand times more people, um, we can get much better generalizable results that actually um, mean more to the average person on the street rather than these sort of perfect results that, you know, is hard to relate to. So I think this goes for you know, whenever we're studying the immune system, we're studying bowel health, gut health, diets, all this stuff. But I think it's particularly good in in the stuff that doesn't get funding attention. Mm -hmm. And we know that, you know, at least one in four, possibly one in three people in the population, the US and the UK, you know, suffer from some uh, gut, mild gut disorders. And they simply aren't getting any attention at all. And this is why it's really important, you know, and we want as many people to take part as possible. Mm-hmm. And we're not actually, you're not actually testing a particular therapeutic. So there's no particular motivation for, 
uh, the pharmaceutical industry to be involved because we're actually talking about lifestyle and diet change and things like this. We're not looking at specific uh, medical treatments. No, it's not like a clinical trial where you'd get a new experimental drug and you see whether it works or not. Um, but we are we are collecting important data, not only about bowel habits, but also whether people are on medications for those bowel habits. Um, so do certain medications make things worse, for example? Uh, does it make it better? You know, a lot of people are on uh, these uh Omeprazole, you know these mm. uh, uh, proton pump inhibitors that for acid reflux, for example, and you know there's some data that these things make other problems worse. Um, many people are on multiple drugs, and these never get looked at really for these um, whether they affect your 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 bowels or not. So it's it's an independent way of looking at some of these very common drugs and seeing how they affect uh, our body. And, um, you know, people really we want to put as much information into this as we can. And with that, we'll be able to feed back really important information, particularly, you know, uh, about the state of the nation's health. And for people with these bowel disorders, giving them some more information, you know, which might relate to simple changes in lifestyle they can make to uh, to improve things. And I think that's the, the big hope because we didn't used to have. You know, 50 years ago, there's a belief that we didn't have anything like these problems. Mm. And it's our modern lifestyle that's actually brought it on. And, you know, along with food allergies and other sort of modern diseases. Uh, and that's why I think we need to look at a, a holistic way of looking at it from a whole lifestyle approach and mm. uh, food habits and um, other things that really just don't get attention because, you know, they're not linked to pharmaceutical companies or or big funding. The other thing I really like about the surveys I've done w w with you and Zoe is, is the fact that you learn about your own physiology, insights into your own health, but that also contributes towards this uh, huge data pool, this sort of um, mega data almost that allows you to, uh, to, to really filter out some quite fine um, pieces of new information just because you've got so many people in the study. And talking of which, uh, Tim, the last time that we were on, uh, we looked at the big IF study, intermittent fasting study. Now, um, I'm looking forward to the paper coming out on this. I know it's not there, but can you give us a few sort of um, little glimpses into some of your data that you have come, come from the intermittent fasting study? As it's you, John, I'll give you a few little teasers. It's just only uh, you and I wouldn't give Tim. other people, but... No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no one's listening. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it was it's in October last year. Um, the Zoe Health Study really la launched this massive experiment into intermittent fasting called the Big If Study. And we had over 100,000 people signed up. And uh, as I said, we've got a paper that's uh, coming out. So I can't give the details. But what we did is we, we asked everyone to restrict the time they ate so it was time restricted eating study and but it was mildly we wanted to you know everyone to participate so, so just do it so you're eating in a 10 hour window and you have 14 hours fasting so it wasn't that tough uh, and people could able could do it early or late they could choose to fit into their lifestyle and uh, amazingly most people did manage to reduce their eating window by two hours which is quite a lot, you know, yeah. given there were no great incentives for all these uh, amazing uh, participants. And the people that did uh, get down to this 10-hour uh, eating window, on average, did get a, an improvement in their mood and an even bigger increase in their self-reported energy levels mm. uh, compared with their baseline results. Mm. And... Um, Anxiety also reduced, interestingly, which we we weren't expecting. And hunger was interesting because initially uh, hunger levels went up a bit, as you might expect. You're suddenly mm. changing the way you eat. You're thinking about food. But, but after the first week, it actually went down. And so the overall, there was actually a drop in, in, in feelings of hunger. And uh, 
The really big impact, though, was for those people who had reported bloating symptoms, something that we're looking at in the Big Poo study, mm. um, 64% um, or some, something, you know, two thirds of people actually got improvement in that in their bloating, which was uh, really interesting. And a lot of people changed their snacking behavior as well. Just we didn't ask them to. We just said, eat all your foods in this in this bit. But it, I think it just, you know, it was a really lovely way to just uh, make people think about what they're doing uh, in subtle ways without, you know, being a bully. And uh, really, we're quite excited with these results that and it just shows, you know, how successful these these sort of citizen science projects mm. can be. And we're going to feed those results back to people. As you said, just like we did with COVID, you know, you get these individual results for your local area, but you also see what's happening uh, globally and uh, really, really feel and you can work out uh, how you're going to fit in with the average. So we'll tell you your results, how you did, yeah. how do you do for your age group, your demographic, but also, you know, is that above average, below average uh, and, you know, potentially we'll be able to point people to ways to improve uh, their gut health, etc. So I think that, that that's really exciting. So yeah, I'm looking forward to be able to talking more when that the full paper comes out. But that's a little teaser just between you and I. Well, that's the interview I recorded this morning with uh, Professor Tim Spector. Always fascinating. I really like this new approach to citizen science that you can all take part in, and I I take part in. We actually recorded that this morning, Monday the 20th of March. You've still got a few days to do the study. I think it runs for the rest of this week. I've put the link at the top of the description, so do click on it. Uh, pretty interesting. I, I think this approach to citizen science really is a big part of the way forward to understand physiology. There's no therapeutics involved. Tim's not trying to get us to take medication. He's not making money by selling us anything. This is optimization of lifestyle to promote metabolic health. And it's metabolic diseases that most of us are dying of. I mean, metabolism affects cancers, of course. But metabolism directly affects heart disease. It affects cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, cholesterol, all of these problems that affect the arteries and the circulation and our general well-being are related to our metabolic health, which is what is being studied. And because we've got very large numbers, because um, Tim and his Zoe and his King's College team get very large numbers in this, you can actually get really good data from that and you can actually filter out really quite fine differences between the population that you simply can't with the clinical trial. And it's holistic and it's related to lifestyle. And just a few of those results there from the intermittent fasting study, really quite impressive. Improved mood. Would you like improved mood? Well, I'm, I'm up for improved mood. Uh, improved energy. Uh, would you like improved energy? Well, I think most of us would say yes to that. Reduced anxiety. Um, anxiety is one of the scourges of modern life anything that reduces that is good in my book this is not taking a medication it's just stopping eating at say six or seven o'clock in the evening and not eating till nine or ten o'clock the the, the 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 next the next morning giving us that period of fasting overnight and the huge metabolic benefits that that has somewhat reduced hunger a little bit of reduced hunger but a lot of reduced bloating and uh re considerably reduced snacking as well i mean if i don't concentrate i'm terrible for snacking you'll just have a few peanuts in the evening or a slice of toast or you know just things you don't really need but if, if you kind of decide no i'm not going to eat after seven o'clock and i'm not going to eat till 10 o'clock the next morning or whatever works for you that period of time uh, has has these benefits and uh tim's recruited over a hundred thousand people in that study that really show that that works so uh do, do take part in the one that's live now the big poo the big poo review because this is clearly of uh, immense importance to our metabolic and uh, gastrointestinal health so uh thank you uh for that uh, great information tim we look forward to you coming back when we've got the the full paper when that's in the public domain and of course thank you for watching <laughs>